It's a great day to serve the Lord. We're, we're going through difficult times and I want to talk this morning about God in us every day. Uh, there's a passage that we've been uh, reading from this morning uh, in Philippians and uh, in which Paul is speaking to the people of Philippi, encouraging them that if they belong to Christ, that they love one another, that they wholeheartedly agree with one another, that they work together with one mind and purpose and not to be selfish or conceited or to try and be self-obsessed, but be humble, thinking of others as better than themselves. And God is encouraging us uh, through this passage today. I believe it speaks to us of what we call the incarnational life, the life of Christ, the life of a God who comes into human existence as a human being. He, although being God who created heaven and earth and everything, um, desires to meet us in our place of need and in doing so to save us, to help us, becomes one of us. And uh, so the incarnational life is, is based on this, this, this fact that, that Jesus, the Son of God, was made human and being conceived of a woman, the Virgin Mary, and uh, because he's fully God and fully human, uh, he is able uh, to save us and help us. Now, this is a teaching that is not in other world religions. Uh, all of the major world religions would find this abhorrent. They find it difficult. Uh, they run from it a mile. And yet we, as followers of Jesus, see it as absolutely the central part of it. And there are some, even some Christian groups that, or so-called Christian groups that don't accept that Jesus is God, the Son. They see him as the son of, perhaps the Son of God or a Son of God. Uh, but uh, uh, we believe that he is Son. And it's essential that we understand that, that God becomes human because if God did not become one of us and die for us and take our place in the grisly, the gruesome act of, of a Roman crucifixion, uh, then, we, uh, uh, then we don't have a saviour. We are, we are back to old religion and striving uh, to get near God. But God has provided a saviour. And so it's based on his merit, not ours, this life that we live. And so God becomes one of us, just like in the movie uh, Avatar, in which uh, uh, Jake Scully, uh, Jake Sully rather, uh, being flown to uh, the planet Pandora, uh, takes on an avatar to, and in order to uh, engage the, the Navi people. And in this uh, scenario that in which he uh, had a simple job to do, uh, one that was actually quite manipulative for the resources of the Navi, uh, suddenly sees light and uh, he falls in love with these people and becomes the saviour, deliverer of these people. And so we see the, the, the nature of in the avatar. Uh, it's in one sense, uh, um, God takes on human nature. And so he becomes the sacrament or the, the saviour, uh, the one who comes from the divine, who comes into our existence and to bring us back into relationship to the Almighty. Now, some of the things that we've done, if we look at the history of humanity in, in, through the scriptures, uh, we see this, uh, uh, this way that through... Uh, man's uh, engagement with temples and uh, with uh, ark, the Ark of the Covenant, the, the, the Ark itself of, of, that floated and saved the human race uh, with, under Noah. And as we, as we look at different buildings and places and instruments that are involved in the Christian life, um, they have been called sacraments. And that 
comes from uh, the Roman notion, actually, of, uh, of when Roman soldiers would yield themselves to the gods and they'd give everything they were and owned, their family, everything they presented as an offering. And so that came into the, the life because the Roman world was very much a part of the, the early Christian world, this uh, notion of, of uh, sacca or holy, uh, in the word Latin, that's the Latin word, and then Mysterian, Greek word, secret rite, um, uh, comes into the, the, the uh, Christian and the, the world of the church. Augustine defining the sacrament as the visible form of an invisible grace. And I think these sort of things, some people are horrified when we talk about things like this, because in the Reformation, they threw out a lot of the uh, notions of uh, the emblems and the artwork that was typically uh, uh, identified with the church. And it's a magnificent buildings that we can see the evidence of that, these buildings that have lasted. Uh, and, uh, and the Reformation tended to try and disintegrate that and say it's Christ only, it's by faith and in Christ only, and which is absolutely true. But in doing so, the church swung to a, a, an ordinary um, way of doing things that lost the message in many cases. And we're seeing the message of the sacredness of things that are dedicated to God. And so we dedicate our children to God as a way of presenting them to God. We, um, we have communion, which is a, a sign of our continuing relationship and identification with Christ. And we do that through bread and, and wine. We do that through material elements. When we get baptized, we do it through water. And uh, whether, we're, whether it's a bucket of water over us or whether it's in a a baptismal tank uh, going under the water. These uh, visible signs are signs of the grace of God. And the amazing thing is that God does something through this. God actually works through these actions and places. I remember when we first moved into what was called uh, Solid Rock Church, it was in a, the YMCA with uh, martial arts there. And the environment was the most difficult thing, place to worship in. Uh, but what a difference when later down uh, the track, we, we were meeting in an old church that had had revival in it. And literally we could feel the presence of angels in that place. And it was so easy to, uh, to preach, to worship, to do everything in that place because it had been dedicated to the purposes of God. And that's like it with us too. And so things mat matter, including our own bodies, are part of a very much part, an important part of our engagement with God. <clears throat> Richard Foster said something, the, the incarnational stream of Christian life focuses on making present and visible the realm of the invisible spirit. This sacramental way of living addresses the crying need to experience God as truly manifest and notoriously active in daily life. So uh, we're just going to go through uh, some, of the aspect, some of the aspects of this uh, passage. And uh, firstly, I want to look at the sacrament of oneness. He says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. God is calling us to oneness, oneness in Christ, but oneness in each other. Um, you know, the body of Christ is God's sacrament. We are his sacrament. And how we treat the, the body of Christ, how we treat the church is how we treat Christ. How we speak about the church is how we speak about Christ. How we speak about our brother and our sister in Christ is how we speak about Christ. And if we alienate ourselves from the church, from our brothers and sisters, we do so to Christ. And that's why... 
the writer of Hebrews says, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is coming near. And uh, God, I believe in these days, this year, probably more than any other year, it's time to rediscover our, our, like our mojo, our own spirit of working out our faith uh, in these times and not to be reliant on all the teaching we've had, all the blessings we've had, all the support we've had over the years. Now is the time to uh, garrison our hearts and minds and be focused to be one with, with one another and, and uh, about our Father's business, just as Jesus was. Not only are we called to be one, and that oneness is actually revealed through baptism. We're, we're, we're speaking about our oneness with Christ and his body there, and communion, speaking of oneness. But we're also called to the sacrament of humility. It, it's, it says there in verse 6, Though he was God, he didn't think equality with God something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. And so we are called to that same sense of humility. Uh, and in doing so, not to be full of ourselves. And a lot of people are doing that during this time. They're indulging. They're, they're hiving away from society and from the church as well. And, and uh, there's that sense of indulgence that's happening, sadly, as people self-medicate. But uh, we're not to be conceited. We're not to... The word conceit means to be excessively appreciative of one's own worth or virtues. <laughs> and we're called not to be uh, self-indulgent in that way or narcissistic, but instead to give ourselves, to take upon the very attitude of Christ who gave himself for others. And he will look after us. He promises and he does every time. He looks after those who give, who follow his example. You know, um, as part of this uh, sacramental life, um, we're, we're also called to a sacrament of practice. It says there that we are to work out, our, work hard to show the results of your salvation or commonly work out your own salvation uh, with fear and with reverence. And so for God is working, it says, in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. I believe these are days, this is a year in which we are to outwork it. We don't need to be pulled this way or yanked that way, but God wants us in all the resource and all the blessing and all that great people have actually spoken and encouraged their lives to actually live out the life, to do them proud. Just as Paul was calling the Philippians to do him proud and that he would be able to give praise for their lives. God is, wants us to, be, to do our leaders, to those who've spoken into our lives, who have ministered into our lives, who've taught the word over so many years into our lives. It's time for us to move from being babies and need constant nurture to being those who actually are empowered by Christ to serve and to lay down our lives for others. I was just so impressed over this past week by, by one of our members, uh, Ian, um, Ian Hollier, um, a, a guy that some of you may know, others may not know him. He's a quiet guy, humble guy, but he got involved with one of his, uh, one of the residents in his block of units. And uh, he was involved on last week as Terry uh, had an episode that uh, left him unconscious. Ian was there to give him uh, CPR and through, through his time in hospital, uh, they stayed with him. The Lord spoke to him as he was waiting on his friend whom he had spent years serving, particularly in the last four years, uh, going over and above the call of duty to, to help uh, Terry to get him out of a mess. Now, Terry, you might think, well, for a worthy person, 
yeah, that's understandable. But Terry was a criminal. He'd been in, inside. He was an angry man. He was a, could be a nasty piece of work. In fact, he had murdered his wife and was estranged from his, his son and uh, seemed to have very few friends. But Ian chose and was called by God to be Terry's friend. It was only in uh, recent weeks, in fact, he was looking for Terry had changed his mind as, with regard to God only in recent weeks and was, had bought a shirt in order that he could come along to the meeting here at Cornerstone. And unfortunately, um, on Saturday night, uh, he was taken to hospital and early Sunday morning, Ian was with him. In fact, Ian was about to, he'd, he'd had this long vigil, he was worn out, he just needed to go to sleep and he was going to go home uh, and have a few hours and then come back just to sit by Terry's bed. But God spoke to him and, and he felt Jesus say to him, can you not wait with me one more hour? And so he did. He made that decision. He changed his mind, changed his plans and waited with Terry one hour. And within that hour, Terry had gone. And he had had that opportunity to speak into Terry's life while he was there in ICU and, and challenge him as he had done for a long time about his place with God, the, the God whom he is now face to face with. I'm so glad for Ian and, and his commitment over those years. It wasn't glorious. It was difficult. It was painful. It stopped him coming to church sometime because of helping Terry, but he did so. You know, the, there are examples in our church, uh, a son or a daughter relating daily with their elderly parent who is in dementia and lost the capacity of memory and the reality and reality and requires endless patience and repetition. A parent working to raise a child with a disability or learning difficulty. I just think of uh, one of my friends here who's, who's looking after it his relative has become the carer for his relative and, and uh, travels down there regularly to make sure, looking after her affairs. Um, or a, a spouse who enjoys uh, a, an obstinate uh, husband uh, or, or a, a wife or a partner and, and perseveres uh, under duress. Um, or a manager working with a troubled or inconsistent employee or an employee working under an overbearing bearing or unappreciative boss. There are all situations that we work in. And that's where Jesus calls us to be the sacrament of his grace in those situations. And not for them to bear down upon us or ruin us, but rather actually to lift us up, that we might be lifted up. You know, the whole notion of worship and we had our first worship night uh, this week and uh, it was just great to be together. I encourage you to come. There's one thing to, to watch the, the worship team do their thing or try and join along on a Sunday morning, but there's just something else being together to worship. Or you might want to come to our prayer meeting on, on Friday night where we worship and pray together. And, you know, worship is something that is costly and the whole notion of Worship in the Old Testament regarded with incense that was burning day and night. And the components of those incense, uh, of, of incense that was burned, was, spoke in every respect of costliness, of being crushed, of valuable things being compressed and, and uh, mined and, and, and uh, uh, sought for. And so it was precious, it was costly. And that reminds us that the notion of worship, of our worship to God, is a costly thing. And, but as we do so, God comes and fills us and gives us joy. And, and that's what uh, Paul was talking about there uh, when he said, um, hold, uh, hold firmly to the word of life, then on the day of Christ's return, I'll be proud that I did not run the race in vain, and that my work was not useless. But I'll rejoice even now if I lose my life. Here was Paul in prison, waiting to have his title, 
life taken. But he saw himself, it says, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God. You know, God wants our lives to be like a river, a river of worship to him, a river of offering. And, and Paul says, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. So Paul is calling us in this time, this COVID time, into the joy of the Lord. And as we take upon ourselves the humility of Christ, as we unite with one another and cooperate and work with whatever's happening, as we unite ourselves in Christ, and as we outwork our life in the ordinary, as we practice what we've had preached to, or practice what we preach, and as, we've, uh, uh, as we uh, take on a worshipping life, then God will shine through us, it says, like the stars. Look, the word liturgy means the people's work. And I believe we're in a season that God is looking to see the people's work. Not, uh, not just at, like at a football game where you see a few people doing a whole lot of work. Everyone else is cheering and in, uh, standing up in the seats. Um, but um, the, the notion of the kingdom of God is quite unlike that. It's countercultural in that we all become participants. We all are in the game. We're all playing our part. We're all working hard. And God wants us, as a result, to all get the glory, as it were, all get the promise that he has promised in Christ. I'm just going to finish by this uh, uh, passage in, in Philippians 3. And Paul challenges the Philippians he says, brothers or brothers and sisters, do not consider myself to have taken hold of any of things as yet. Now, he had a lot to be proud of. In fact, he had the, the religious pedigree to, be, to die for. And he said, I count it all but loss. But he says, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Let's forget what is behind. And straining toward what is ahead, I press on. God calls us to press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. And so the divine Christ in you and I is translated through us into human life and into the reality of other people. And so you and I, we uh, God's incarnation. We are the re revelation of God in the, in the mundane, in the ordinary, in the normal to those around us. Let's enter in and really take hold of that in Jesus' name. Amen.